Okay, so uh, hopefully there's uh, still some folks interested in uh, GI malignancies uh, here in the room. So uh, I wanna start by thanking Dr. Shah and uh, the Binaitara Foundation for the opportunity to speak um, today. Also to, uh, wanted to congratulate uh, Dr. Shah, Dr. Rondelli and Dr. Walker for all this uh, amazing uh, initiative. These are uh, my disclosures. They are all relative to uh, my involvement as a PI in early phase studies at the uh, University of uh, Utah. So I'm gonna be uh, going uh, through uh, upper GI malignancies. I will have a slide or a couple of slides about standard of care and then uh, transition quickly to um, novel updates in 2017. Starting with uh, esophagogastric uh, cancer, as you can see uh, on this uh, slide, less than 50%, uh, not sure this, this one is working, but less than 50% of these patients are going to be diagnosed with uh, early disease, uh, local disease, and they are candidates to uh, radical treatments, including um, surgery. Uh, the favorite approach here in U.S. it's neoadjuvant chemo radiation followed by uh, resection. For patients with uh, distal gastric cancers, the favorite approach is uh, periop uh, chemotherapy, and we will discuss today uh, updates from uh, ASCO 2017 in this uh, setting. This is a busy slide, but the message from this slide is that for patients with uh, metastatic uh, esophagogastric cancer. We favor doublets with uh, fluoropyrimidines in combination with either irinotecum based on uh, a randomized phase three study completed in France that showed uh, Falfiri had similar overall survival compared to a triplet with epirubicin, cisplatin, and 5-FU. And we have similar data with uh, Falfox uh, compared to ECF from the CalGB study uh, completed here in US. This was a randomized phase two uh, study. There's some data with uh, triplets uh, based on uh, a European study that uh, was uh, reported around 10 years ago that compared docetaxel, cisplatin, and 5-FU to cisplatin and 5-FU. This study showed a modest improvement in survival in the range of one month, but as you can see on the slide, there was a substantial increase in toxicities with grade three, four adverse events up to 70% of the patients. So uh, I rarely use a triplet in the palliative setting. If you are to use a triplet, I think you need to discuss uh, carefully with your patient the small magnitude of the uh, benefit and uh, the increase in toxicities that we will see with the triplet. Let me try this again. I think the pointer doesn't work. Out. Yep. I'll just use the, move the slides. So for patients with uh, uh, metastatic disease, talking about target therapies, we have a couple of drugs that have been approved in this setting. Uh, Trastuzumab for patients with HER2 positive gastroesophageal cancer in the TOGA trial showed an improvement in survival in the range of uh, three months and uh, ramucirumab also in the second line, a single agent or in combination with uh, paclitaxel have also shown improvement in uh, survival. I want you to keep this plot in mind to uh, sort of understand better what we're gonna be discussing in the next slides. This is data from the CROSS trial. This trial randomized patients to, with locally advanced esophageal cancer to neoadjuvant chemo radiation followed by surgery or surgery up front. What you can see on this uh, uh, plot is that those patients who attain a pathologic complete response survive longer. And that's why a goal during uh, neoadjuvant treatments or studies evaluating neoadjuvant treatments is to try to increase the pathologic complete response that we see at the time of resection. So and this take us to the CalGB study. This was a randomized study that was presented from, by Dr. Goodman from University of Colorado at ASCO GI uh, this past uh, January. On this study, patients with T3, T4, or positive uh, lymph nodes esophageal cancer on initial staging were randomized to two different backbones of chemotherapy, Folfox versus uh, carboplatin uh, paglitaxel. They had a baseline PET-CT, and after uh, five, seven, six weeks, they had a restaging PET-CT to identify those patients that were not responding to induction chemotherapy. So those patients who were not responding by PET to induction chemotherapy and PET non-responders were uh, considered those who had a SUV 
uptake decreased less than 35%, those patients were crossover to the other backbone of chemotherapy. The hypothesis on this study was that by crossing over those head non-responders patients, we might be able to see a PCR in the range of 5 to 20%. And indeed, that's what the authors of this uh, study uh, found. So you can see uh, on the left side are the patients who started with induction Folfox. On the right side are those patients who started with induction Carbotaxel. And for each group on the right side, you have those patients who were pet non-responders and were crossover. And you can see that the PCR for each of those groups met the uh, criteria for um, or the hypothesis of the study with PCRs of 19 and 17 uh, percent. So it's intriguing, though, that those patients that were considered uh, carbotaxel responders by PET only had a PCR of 12 percent. And this is intriguing because on the CROSS trial, the PCR for adenocarcinoma was twice this one. It was 23 percent. So you expect that these patients that were selected based on a response with PET-CT will have a higher rate of PCR compared to the CROSS trial, where patients were not selected uh, at all. So my take on this study, this is a positive study. This is uh, not a study that is going to change the standard of care because uh, uh, some issues we will discuss. But clearly, we can improve the pathologic complete response by using a, a PET as a pharmacodynamic imaging test and, this, and then crossing over to the other backbone of chemotherapy. Why this is not going to change the standard of care? Because induction chemotherapy followed by chemoradiation followed by surgery is not standard of care for adenocarcinoma of the esophagus, meaning there's no randomized phase three trial data that has compared this approach to chemoradiation followed by uh, surgery. And it's possible, uh, we don't have all the data from this study, but one could hypothesize that maybe these patients may have uh, more post-op complications compared to those getting chemoradiation followed by surgery. In addition, uh, the phase two data that we have with uh, neoadjuvant uh, chemo or induction chemo followed by chem um, chemoradiation followed by surgery does not show the, that the PCR increased compared to uh, historical uh, controls. So this is the uh, first uh, case that we have. This is a 45-year-old uh, gentleman uh, with excellent performance status and adenocarcinoma of the G junction. Uh, staged by ultrasound as a T2N1 with a PET-CT negative for metastatic disease. What treatment would you uh, consider for uh, this uh, patient? I believe the, uh, the answer system is not working, so I will just go through the, through the questions and we'll answer those for, for you. So resection, we know that uh, that's not the answer. The cross trial showed that neoadjuvant chemoradiation followed by surgery improves survival on these uh, patients. Neoadjuvant chemoradiation with carboplatin paclitaxel Q3 weeks. This is a tricky question because chemotherapy is given weekly, so this is not uh, the answer either. Periop chemotherapy with FLOT. Uh, we will discuss the FLOT trial data today. This is the right answer for this, um, for this question. Surgery followed by radiation. We know from the intergroup trial that surgery followed by chemoradiation improves uh, survival, so this is not uh, the answer either. This is a tricky question for reasons that I will discuss later, because if I have a patient with G-junction adenocarcinoma, I will still favor chemoradiation with weekly carbotaxel prior to surgery, for some reasons I will discuss during my discussion of the FLOT4 uh, data study. So uh, periop chemotherapy in gastric cancer. This was a study that was presented at ASCO this year that is going to change the standard of care in this setting. So this was a randomized phase three trial that included uh, patients with uh, distal gastric cancer and patients with uh, G-junction cancers, roughly 50% uh, of each. Patients were randomized to periop uh, chemotherapy with FLOT4 or periop uh, ECF. And uh, you can, uh, when um, patients were stratified by ECOG, location of primary age and nodal status, when we look at the data, you see a very impressive improvement in survival of 15 months. So patients had a, uh, these studies show that 23% decrease in the risk of uh, death with a hazard rate of 0.77. Median overall survival improved from 35 to 50 months, and the five-year survival rate improved from 35 to roughly around 45%. Uh, this benefit was seen across all subgroups, including patients with small T1, T2 tumors or patients with negative uh, lymph nodes. 
This is a comparison between the treatment arms, and you can see that most of these patients were able to proceed to surgery, uh, over 95% of the patients. You can also see that um, downstaging was more frequent in the float arm, as shown by increased percentage of R0 resection, increased uh, percentage of small T1 lesions, and increased percentage of uh, N0, or negative uh, lymph nodes. You can also see that the uh, rate of uh, grade three, four infections was higher in the uh, float arm, 18 versus 9%. Uh, However, the uh, serious adverse events or toxic deaths were similar in between both arms, as well as it was uh, actually indeed uh, discontinuation per patient request or uh, toxicity was indeed higher on the ECF arm compared to uh, the float uh, arm. So my take on this study is uh, this is certainly the new standard of care for uh, your, when you are doing periop chemotherapy in your patients with distal uh, gastric cancer. They included 50% of uh, patients with uh, G-junction tumors, so you could consider this for patients with G-junction tumors. However, I'm going to tell you why I will not do this for a patient with G-junction tumor. We know that the PCR with the cross trial for adenocarcinoma was 23%. We don't know yet the PCR on the FLOT study. It has not been reported. However, if we look at smaller phase two trial where they uh, use FLOT, the PCR was 15%. So it's possible that the PCR with FLOT is gonna be less than the PCR that we have seen with the CROSS trial. We know that the PCR predicts better over a survival. So that means that for me, for my practice, until I see the PCR data from this uh, flood uh, trial, for patients with G junction, I will continue to use neoadjuvant chemo radiation followed by uh, surgery. It will be very important for all of us to see the results of the ESOPEC trial that is currently ongoing, that it's comparing flood versus cross to decide which regimen we're gonna be using in these patients. I didn't have a chance to present uh, immunotherapy on esophagogastric cancer, but I think it's important for you to remember that uh, based on presentations of uh, Checkmate as well as keynote studies at ASCO this year, we see response rate for uh, advanced esophagogastric cancer in the third, fourth line in the range of uh, 15 to uh, 5 percent. Important also to remember that the response rate decreases as patients are more heavily pretreated similar to what we see with uh, cytotoxic. So the response rate in the fourth line setting is as low as 6% versus 16% in the uh, third line setting. So very likely we will see immunotherapy coming up front to therapy in uh, clinical trials in uh, the next years. Moving to hepatocellular carcinoma. This is uh, a disease, uh, like we see around 40,000 40, um, uh, uh, cancer of the liver diagnosed every year. Most of them are going to be hepatocellular uh, carcinoma followed by intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. Most of these patients are going to develop uh, hepatocellular carcinoma in the setting of uh, cirrhosis. And uh, in Western population, the most common cause uh, is going to be hepatitis C infection followed by alcohol. So this is the Barcelona Clinic Liver Cancer Staging System. I'm not going to go through this today, but I think uh, it will be uh, beneficial for you to always consider have this uh, algorithm when you see one of these patients with hepatocellular cancer. There's multiple classification systems for HCC. The advantage of this one is that it provides treatment options together with uh, staging. So I'm going to go quickly through this because this is well-known data. So Rafenib is uh, approved for uh, first-line uh, treatment of patients with uh, metastatic uh, or metastatic HCC. So uh, regorafenib is a drug that was approved this year in the second line by the FDA based on data from this randomized phase three study. So patients were randomized to uh, observation or placebo for, uh, or uh, regorafenib in the second line. And you can see that there's a nice improvement in survival in, around, in the range of three months. You can also see that these were patients with Chalpuke A, so uh, applies only to Chalpuke A patients who had pri previously tolerated well sorafenib. And even though they had a grade three, four treatment related adverse events as high as 50%. So this drug caused significant toxicities and you need to be aware of that when taking care of these uh, patients. The other thing I wanted to point out of this study, the response rate was 10%, which I think it's 
reasonable in the second line for HCC, especially knowing that the response rate for sorafenib in the first line is as low as 2%. Briefly, a couple of slides about this Checkmate study. This is a study uh, with uh, nivolumab in patients with advanced HCC. Uh, recently published, they included uh, different cohorts of patients, patients who have uh, or who were sorafenib naive, patients who had progressed to prior sorafenib, patients with hepatitis C uh, infection, patients with hepatitis B infection. What you can see is that there is consistently a response rate in the range of uh, 15 to 30 percent, regardless of the uh, treatment arm, indicating that nivolumab, nivolumab is effective in all these different uh, cohorts. So similar to other studies, the responses were seen regardless of the PDL1 status. So PDL1 expression is not a good biomarker to identify patients with HCC that may respond to uh, immunotherapy. So this is a busy table, but uh, the message is at the bottom of the table. So this is a table that includes both the first line study with sorafenib as well as the two second line studies with regorafenib and nivolumab. And uh, the population of patients included in uh, uh, any of these three studies was actually very similar, maybe with the exception of uh, regorafenib and nivolumab patients having higher frequency of uh, extrahepatic disease. But look at the response rate. Response rate for uh, regorafenib in the first line was 2%. Response rate for, uh, for regorafenib in the second line, 10% and 20% for nivolumab, uh, again, in the second line. Of course, the nivolumab trial was a smaller study with only 200 patients compared to roughly 300, 500 on the other studies, and it's possible that the response rate is overestimated. Uh, we do have a phase three trial that uh, recently compared sorafenib and nivolumab in the first line, uh, and we are awaiting the results of this study within the next uh, year. Now, this is uh, the second case I wanted to discuss. This is a 78-year-old male with uh, Chalpuk A cirrhosis, secondary to hepatitis C infection, excellent performance status, a six centimeter mass in the right hepatic lobe with uh, arterial enhancement and a typical uh, delayed uh, washout, and at least five satellite lesions, five to three centimeter in size each. What is the next step for this patient? Number one, order a biopsy. So this is not the case because we do have typical radiological findings that are diagnostic for HCC on this patient, like arterial enhancement as well as delayed uh, washout. So we don't need to get a biopsy. It's the only tu solid tumor for which we don't need a, to get a biopsy to establish the diagnosis. Transplant list. So this is a patient who's uh, beyond Milan criteria. We, uh, some centers are uh, willing to transplant patients beyond Milan criteria and still get uh, significant or uh, very reasonable five-year survival rates. However, this patient is 78 year old. So this is typically an older patient for liver transplant. We uh, typically transplant patients with in the range of 50s, 60s, and often a cutoff of 70. It's used to decide who's a candidate for liver transplant. Days followed by sorafenib. This is not uh, an option for uh, some new data that I will be discussing in the next uh, slides. So the, there's no benefit from adding sorafenib to taste. Nivolumab, not an option because uh, we only have data from a phase one, two study, so it has not yet changed standard of care. So the uh, treatment for this patient should be either taste or uh, sorafenib, and we will also discuss that with some of the new data presented this year. So this is a, a randomized phase two trial that was uh, conducted in UK, the TACE uh, two uh, trial. This trial uh, compared sorafenib, uh, compared uh, TACE plus uh, placebo versus TACE plus sorafenib. The hypothesis here is that uh, uh, liver-directed therapy is going to induce some hypoxia that will uh, lead to activation of the HIF-1 alpha pathway and therefore activation of angiogenesis. So combining taste with an angiogenesis inhibitor like uh, sorafenib has a strong preclinical uh, data. Unfortunately, as you can see, the trial, this uh, randomized phase three study was uh, negative. Look, I wanted to uh, point out this, uh, the incidence of uh, alcohol-related cirrhosis, HCC in UK, and I'm gonna take a couple of minutes to talk about uh, this, because I'm from Spain, 
uh, my brother lives in Mallorca, and we do see a lot of tourists from UK coming to uh, Mallorca and doing some sort of crazy things. So they have invented this sport called balconing. I don't think it needs a lot of description, right? So just by looking at the picture, you all know what it is. In Spain, we used to refer to this in a, a different way. We actually call this to do a Brexit or just natural selection because it depends <laughs> on how smart you are that you will be able to make it back to UK or not. Anyway. I think that this jump doesn't look very promising. I hope the guy make it to the pool, and hopefully uh, when he went back to UK, he realized that he needs to change some things in his life. <laughs> so this is the uh, Sirvenif trial. This is um, a randomized trial that was conducted uh, in Asia, uh, and it was recently presented at ASCO. This is a very important trial because we don't know how to uh, treat patients with uh, multi-satellite uh, or multinodular HCC. We offer typically these patients taste, but it's very likely that sorafenib is a reasonable treatment option for these patients. So what the authors of this study did, they randomized those patients to sorafenib or uh, um, uh, CIRT, sorry, which is radioactive uh, spheres. So uh, a, a significant caveat with this study is that 30% of the patients that were randomized to CIRT, Y90, actually did not receive the allocated intervention. And this is important when we look at the results of this study. This was a negative study. There was no improvement in survival in the intention to treat uh, population. So it's hard to show a benefit from an experimental uh, treatment if your patients, if 30% of your patients are not getting the experimental uh, treatment. So these results were not a surprise. However, CERT was definitely better tolerated. When you look at the incidence of uh, grade three, four treatment related adverse events, it was uh, as uh, low as 13% 30, with uh, CERT versus close to 40% with sorafenib. So if you have a patient that does not want to go through the side effects of sorafenib, I think that CERT or Y90 is certainly a treatment option for uh, this population of uh, patients. Also, when they look at the, uh, per, um, when they did a per protocol analysis, they were able to see a modest improvement in survival with the uh, CERT uh, treatment again. Keep in mind, 30% of those patients did not receive the allocated intervention, so that's why it's important to look at the analysis per actual treatment that was received. Moving to cholangiocarcinoma, this is a rare disease in Western uh, countries, so less than um, six patients per 100,000 uh, diagnosed in uh, Western populations, different to uh, uh, Asia, where uh, due to uh, liver fluke inf infestation, another risk factor, this is a relatively high prevalence uh, disease. So the state of the art for cholangiocarcinoma, these are patients that even if they have resection, do consistently poorly. So the five-year survival rate is as low as 30% despite uh, resection. So until this year, we, don't ha we did not have any data from a randomized trial to support adjuvant treatment in these patients. There was a small trial conducted in Japan where patients after surgery had been randomized to mitomycin C, 5-FU, and had shown some uh, uh, modest uh, benefit, but again, uh, with a combination of drugs that we uh, typically don't use in the clinic due to uh, toxicities of mitomycin. So uh, two trials have been presented uh, this year. At uh, ASCO GI, we had the French uh, presenting the results of the uh, gemcitabine oxaliplatin study. This was a negative study. At ASCO, we had Dr. Primbrons from UK presented the data from the Bill Cap study, a positive study that we will discuss in today. In the metastatic setting, nothing has really uh, changed. We continue to use uh, cisplatin gemcitabine that has shown improvement in survival compared to gemcitabine on the ABC trial uh, published a few years ago. In terms of target therapies, we, we, have, uh, we are star starting to understand the intrinsic biology of this disease, uh, but uh, nothing yet that can be applied to the standard of care. So uh, cholangiocarcinoma, it's a pool of different diseases that due to being a rare disease are often lumped together into clinical trials. But clearly when we look at the molecular profile, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, high or relatively uh, high frequency of uh, FGFR or IDH mutations in the range of 15 to 20 percent, gallbladder cancer, we do see uh, HER2 amplifications. And then for distal extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, we do see pic 3 ca mutations in addition to other aberrations such as uh, BRCA1 or 2. So 
Keep in mind that when we get these clinical trials, uh, it's difficult to understand uh, the results of the trial just because the population of uh, patients included have very different genetic uh, backgrounds. So these are the results of the Bill Cap study. This was an um, adjuvant study for patients who have resection with uh, any biliary type cancer, gallbladder, intrahepatic cholangio, or extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. Patients were randomized to uh, adjuvant treatment with capecitabine, eight cycles versus uh, observation. This was for patients with ECOG performance status 0-1. They included a small population of uh, PS2 patients, and I don't think that because of the small size of PS2 patients include, we can extrapolate these results to the PS2 population. Patients were stratified by surgical center, tumor site, um, resection margins, as well as uh, performance status. And this is the data. This is a positive study. It may have not been statistically significant, but you can see an early separation of the survival curves, and you can see also the magnitude of the benefit. 15 months improvement with adjuvant Cape I mean 50 months compared to observation. When they did uh, an analysis adjusting for uh, prognostic factors that included uh, nodal status as well as uh, grade of disease and gender, actually this data was strongly uh, significant. So when they presented the subgroup analysis, you can see that uh, basically all subgroup of patients benefited from the treatment, maybe with the exception of patients with um, high uh, cholangiocarcinoma. I cannot point them out here, but um, uh, that was a small subgroup of patients. Um, uh, it's, we need to be very uh, careful when uh, doing uh, analysis based on these small uh, subgroups of patients. So when we look at uh, both the studies that presented this year, the Prodice study and the Bill Cap study, again the Prodice study with adjuvant Gemox and then the Bill Cap study with adjuvant Cape Sarabin, the first thing that needs to uh, caught our attention is a different population of patients included in these studies. The Prodice study included up to 44% of patients with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. That was a negative study. We know that intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma had a worse prognosis than uh, distal uh, cholangiocarcinoma. The BILCAP study only included a small population of patients with uh, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, less than 20%. So we could hypothesize that uh, part of not uh, or having a negative, uh, part of the negative results of the PRODITS study is due to the uh, large population of patients with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. So, my take on this study is that adjuvant Cape Sarabin is the new standard of care for patients with completely resected uh, biliary malignancies and excellent performance status. As I mentioned, less than 3% of the patients included in this study had PS2, and therefore I don't believe that these results can be extrapolated to a PS2 population. Uh, in uh, the subgroup analysis, I mentioned that uh, higher patients are less likely to benefit, so we may hypothesize whether for those patients uh, chemotherapy followed by chemo radiation uh, is the best way to go based on the data from, a, from the SWOC study. That was a, a phase two study that showed the feasibility of doing adjuvant chemo followed by chemo radiation in patients with uh, uh, resected biliary malignancies. So uh, last question, this is a 68-year-old male with adenocarcinoma of the head of the pancreas, status post uh, Whipple. The past showed poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma, two out of 15 lymph nodes, positive for disease. And uh, there was a, this was an R1 resection with a positive uh, posterior uncinate uh, margin. Uh, as I mentioned, excellent performance status, and the PET-CT did not show any evidence of metastatic disease. What treatment would you offer based on the best level of evidence? So number one, modified fulfilinox six months, or number two, abraxin in six months. These are approved treatments for patients with metastatic disease, so these are not uh, the answers. Number five, uh, liposomal irinotecan combined with 5-FU, it's an approved regimen for the second line uh, metastatic pancreatic cancer, so that's not the option either. Number three, Gemcitabine one month followed by chemo radiation with five of you followed by gemcitabine three months. This is one of the treatment arms from uh, RTOG 9704. This was a randomized study that compared this regimen that I showed in uh, option number three versus a regimen that had uh, five of you instead of uh, gemcitabine as part of the induction chemotherapy. And that, five minutes. So that trial did not show a control arm without radiation. Uh, 
So the best level of evidence is actually number four, which is gemcitabine plus capecitabine uh, based on the results of this SPAC4 trial that I'm going to be presenting today. So I'm going to move quickly to the SPAC4 trial. The SPAC4 trial was a randomized phase three trial that was uh, recently uh, published. Uh, this uh, study randomized patients with resected pancreatic cancer uh, within two, uh, 12 weeks of surgery. The study was mostly conducted in UK, although there were some other European sites that enrolled uh, patients. Patients were randomized to single agent gemcitabine, that was the standard of care based on the CONCO1 uh, study until this year, versus gemcitabine uh, plus capecitabine. You can see that this was a high risk population as shown by high rate of positive margin, 60%, high rate of uh, positive lymph nodes, and no limit on the CA199 at the time of enrollment. That means that uh, up to or close to 20% of the patients enrolled on the study had a CA199 above 92. That was the limit for enrollment in the CONCO uh, trial. So this is the data. You can see there's a nice improvement in survival with gemcitabine, capecitabine compared to single agent gemcitabine. So roughly three months improvement in survival for these uh, patients. So uh, same data for uh, patients with uh, R1 resections. And the authors concluded that the toxicities were manageable, and they were because the grade three, four, uh, four toxicities were less than 10%. However, look at the high incidence of neutropenia. 40% of these patients had grade three, four uh, neutropenia. While we always say that if not clinically significant, this is not a problem, on a regimen where you're going to continue Cape Sarabin until day 21, if you have a patient with grade three, four neutropenia on day 15, that means that you're gonna need to hold the Cape Sarabin. And indeed, this patient, when you look at the intensity of the Cape Sarabin deliver, intensity was 80%. So it's likely that we're going to need to do those reductions on these patients on uh, GenCap. This is uh, sort of my last slide. This is the progress that has been made in the uh, adjuvant setting in uh, pancreatic cancer. So uh, all those studies that you have plotted there are the adjuvant trials that have been reported uh, in the last 30 years. So you can see that the five-year survival rate has uh, basically doubled from 14% to 29% based on the SPAC4 data. The uh, Japanese trial, the O1 trial, I think it's an outlier based on uh, some pharmacodynamic uh, differences and the different way that uh, Asian patients metabolize S1. Uh, we do see higher toxicities with S1, which is an oral fluoropidimidine, and that's why uh, we have not been able to reproduce these results in uh, Western studies. Bottom line, we have increased the five-year survival rate. I still consider these results are disappointing, and this is likely related to the fact that this is a systemic disease at the time of uh, its diagnosis. So my take for SPAC4 is that this definitely is the new standard of care. Uh, we, um, I'm, I'm already using GenCap uh, uh, in, in my practice, and I think that you should consider using GenCap based on the results of this uh, study. It's important to keep in mind that uh, when we look at the GenCap data, less than 40% uh, of the patients receive salvage chemotherapy, and that means that uh, the survival data may even be better if uh, we are more proactive uh, at the time of relapse uh, uh, if patients have good performance status and so on. There's some skepticism in U.S., not in U.S., in U.K., in terms of the role of uh, salvage chemotherapy as shown by the low uh, percentage of patients that went to salvage chemotherapy following relapse. So updates for 2017. Number one, I did not present it, pembrolizumab. So if you have a patient with advanced GI cancer, you need to request MSI testing on all your patients with metastatic GI cancer. Pembrolizumab is the first uh, tissue agnostic drug approval, and you should consider uh, pembrolizumab after uh, failure to standard chemotherapy on these uh, patients. For patients with esophagogastric cancer, PET has the potential to be considered as a pharmacodynamic imaging test to personalize treatment in the future. FLOT is the new standard of care for perioperative chemotherapy for patients with uh, early gastric cancer. For uh, HCC, there's no overall survival improvement, adding sorafenib uh, to taste. We do have some uh, promising response rate with uh, nivolumab, and we are eagerly awaiting the results of first-line trial that compare nivolumab versus sorafenib in these uh, patients. And lastly, a new adjuvant uh, treat or new standards of care for adjuvant treatment for both pancreatic cancer as well as uh, resected biliary malignancies. And last, this is uh, slides for my hometown. This is uh, Granada in Spain. Uh, 
uh, that's Alhambra, which is a Muslim castle, and uh, that behind is where I learned skiing. So very different landscape to Utah, but I still like Utah. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. So we have time for a couple of questions. Well, thank you for excellent presentation uh, on this complicated topic. Now, as you know, uh, there are numerous genetic mutations in all these malignancies, and now we are trying to move on from organ-based cancer to more molecularly defined malignancies. Um, do you think it would be a good idea to do next-gen sequencing the way we consider in lung cancer in these malignancies and uh, look, at, look for targeted agents? Right, so uh, I think that's an excellent question. The only uh, data that I have presented today for which that really applies is definitely gastric cancer. If you have a patient with metastatic gastric cancer, you definitely need to look at HER2 amplification, right? So there's no approved target therapies for uh, pancreatic cancer. Well, yes, you have erlotinib. I haven't used erlotinib. I think that the data for erlotinib, it's uh, minimal improvement in survival of two weeks, so not having a good way to identify uh, patients likely to respond to erlotinib, I don't know use it on my practice. However, yes, I order next-gen sequencing on all my patients with uh, metastatic uh, GI malignancies because we do have uh, phase one trials in our institution. So if you have, for instance, the MATCH trial or the TAPUR study uh, trial open in your institution or phase one trials where uh, next-gen sequencing may uh, identify uh, patients who have actionable aberrations that can help you get them on a trial, I think, of course, you should be doing that. Outside more, cleaning. Yeah, and of course, what I mentioned about MSI testing, we need to do MSI testing on all our patients with GI malignancies. Absolutely. So, so uh, outside of clinical trials, uh, do you get kickback from insurance company in coverage of next-gen sequencing? So um, I don't want to disclose any of the uh, next-gen uh, sequencing companies that we use, uh, but there's one, and I can tell you the name uh, after the talk that uh, has uh, some agreement with Medicare, so uh, patients that are under Medicare can get this next-gen sequencing done through that company without any cost to the patient. Medicare is paying for that. 